Let's see if I manage like this. So these are the points that I will be going through in this topic. So first I will speak of the phases of mediation process and methodology. I will try to illustrate the challenges to IP mediation, how to solve difficulties, at least some of them during the mediation process. And then Goran will continue with the roles of mediators and parties involved. And then we will hopefully have some questions or have a discussion with the audience. Now, the phases of the mediation process. Here we have the basic structure of a mediation, mediation process that actually was already um, tackled by, by Goran to some extent. It can, of course, vary depending on the mediator's style and on the party's conduct during the negotiations. What I will do is outline how mediation is generally carried out at EU IPO, which starts with a request by the parties or by one of the parties, or a proposal by the rapporteur, who at EU IPO is like a second instance judge. And once initiated, mediation continues with a preparation phase that involves pre-mediation planning and initial contacts with the parties. And passing on to the actual mediation day, this starts with an opening session, continues with intermittent private and joint sessions until a conclusion is hopefully reached. Here we will see how the process is initiated, at least at the EU IPO where mediation presupposes a pending appeal proceeding in inter-parties cases. So in trademark opposition and cancellation proceedings and in community design invalidity proceedings. Now there are three ways that a mediation can start. There can be a unilateral request when one of the parties to the appeal proceeding requests that mediation proceedings are conducted in the case. The appeal before the board's is put on hold and we send the request to the other party. Then a reporting mediator is appointed, who's one of our mediators, to contact the representatives of the other party to explain the process and inquire whether there is an interest in agreeing to the mediation. If the proposal is accepted by the other party, the mediation process is triggered. If the proposal is declined because the other party is not interested, the appeal proceedings will resume. Now, the easiest scenario is when there is a bilateral request. So both parties agree to mediate and they send a joint request to the ADR service. This can be made by means of a letter or by a form that we have online on our website. In such a case, the parties are agree jointly to mediator, to a mediator or mediators on a list of mediators that can be found on our website that we will see now. If they have difficulties in choosing a mediator, they may be helped by the ADR service in selecting an appropriate mediator, which can be on the basis of the language of the mediation or experience of the mediator in a particular field. If there is a bilateral request, the appeal proceedings at EU IPO are suspended until the mediation is completed. The third way to initiate a mediation before EU IPO is when the rapporteur considers that the case is adequate for mediation, as in the examples given to you before. In this scenario, the rapporteur sends a communication to both parties in the appeal proceedings proposing mediation. And also in this case, the appeal is put on hold. If the rapporteur's proposal is accepted by both parties, the mediation continues. If not, it, the appeal proceedings will be resumed. So here you can see a list. It's not actually the full list, it's only some of our mediators at EU IPO. Unfortunately, I can't see Goran on this one, 
Uh, but we, I think um, we are about 32 mediators right now, and you can find us on the, on the link that I show above. Um, as I said, the ADR service can help the parties to choose a mediator. The selection is generally language, experience, the availability of the mediator. And we can have one mediator or two mediators, which is what we call co-mediators in a case. So once the proceedings initiate, the mediator contacts the parties through their representatives, normally via email to present him or herself. The mediator will then ask them where the mediation shall take place. This can be in person, in Alicante or Brussels, or online. Due to the current situation, obviously all of our most recent mediations have been taken place, have taken place online. If a meeting in person should take place, a suitable date should be found. In the preparatory contact, the mediator will recall the confidentiality of the mediation process and will insist that decision takers of the parties are present. So those having authority to sign the agreement on behalf of the party have to be present in the mediation. The mediator will send the mediation agreement to the representatives that they review and sign. This agreement includes a confidentiality annex, which is binding for all actors in the mediation. Finally, the mediator will set a time frame for receiving the summary of the case and, will re and to reply to questions regarding the expectations, chances of succeeding in the dispute, etc. I will show you afterwards what these questions are. The summary should not be too long and should include the business and commercial aspects of the case. And naturally, it is only for the mediator to read. So it may be necessary to exchange several emails and calls with the parties and their representatives to have all information that may be useful before the actual mediation day, what we call also mediation conference. Especially now that most of the mediations are still online, this enables us to do much of the negotiations in previous exchanges before actually sitting the parties together. And it also helps the mediators to create rapport, a connection with the parties and build up a trust in the mediator who is the one driving the process. Now the actual mediation day, when they meet, they can meet in person or online. So normally now is the joint session takes place through Zoom or any other platform. And this would be a classic mediation day with the parties meeting in person. So they would have an initial joint session. The mediator would make an introduction outlining the important aspects as you already know by now. And after this, each party would make an opening statement. Ideally, this is given by the party themselves, so by the CEO of the company, but it may be completed by the lawyers who obviously also need to be heard, right? After this initial joint meeting, there would be a breakup into individual private sessions, which are also called caucuses. In these sessions, the parties are separated so that mediators can speak to them confidentially. Ideally, a mediator will try to spend the same amount of time with each party, so none of them thinks that the mediator favors the other. Later in the day, the mediator will introduce further joint sessions with the parties, depending on how they get along, how the negotiations proceed. If they go well at the end of the day, of the day we would try drafting um, heads of agreement or some kind of memorandum of understanding, MOU. The purpose of this is that a roadmap is left so that the parties shall continue to conclude the settlement of the dispute as normally it is not always possible to draft the complete agreement with all the necessary legal clauses in one same day. The mediator meet, the mediator's conference or meeting would end um, with him or her summarizing the conclusions of what the next steps would be to finalize the agreement. Let me tell you that mediation day is usually very long, uh, but if there has been a good preparation beforehand, it can be shorter. So we now would come to the challenges 
of IP mediation. And if you allow me, I would like to share with you some tips, some practical tips that I use to prevent or solve difficulties, which can be very varied depending on the parties and the conflict during the mediation process. Uh, please bear in mind, these are my personal strategies. They might not work for you. Um, you would do what you think best possible in the moment, depending on the conflict. So maybe you can use these um, tips or you can just forget about them when I finish talking. What I wanted to highlight here is that preparation is quintessential to a good mediation process. So before starting the actual mediation, I would send the parties a list of questions to clarify the pending issues. And I've been using them in the last two mediations I handled here at EUIPO. And they turned out to be extremely useful as I understood a lot from the conflict before actually sitting the parties together or even exploring with one party alone. So I could understand much more when you see um, the questions would be, for example, what is your client's time frame for concluding this conflict? Are there any other proceedings between the parties? Is there any other issue concerning the other party, such as commercial conflict? So we would be asking this to each party separately, okay? Another question would be, what would be for you the best possible resolution of the conflict from your perspective? in particular from a commercial perspective, the BATNA, the best alternative to, um, to, a conf to a litigation? And what would be the worst case scenario? And what would your client like to avoid at all costs? What is your client's leeway for settlement? Would there be a possibility of future corporations with the other side? Very important question. Which are the risks associated with this conflict, such as financial impact, loss of reputation, maybe a PR fallout? Does your client have interests in particular territories within the EU or in any other country? A question which brings out interesting information is, in the opinion of your client, where lie the interests of the other side? Where does your client see the highest hurdles for a resolution and how can these hurdles be overcome in your opinion? How important is an amicable resolution for your client and why? Of course, there must be many, many other questions that you can think of. And as I say, from my experience, they help a lot to understand. So maybe you can, you can use these in the future as well. As a second tip, uh, what I suggest to do at the beginning of the actual meeting is I would set up an agenda of the day, and maybe with four to five act, um, items that would structure the day and show the parties what they can expect. It would also show the parties that I have been preparing. It makes the parties feel safe. And this would be in physical meetings. I would have prepared a flip chart and I would leave the agenda hanging in the room because this would show that we are making progress along the day, which as you will see is also very important. Um, now I'd like to very quickly talk about deadlock, which is one of the biggest challenges I find that we can have in an IP mediation or in any mediation. Um, the Deadlock is what we call when no progress is made, right? Oh gosh, we're in deadlock. We're not moving forward, right? And there may be many reasons for a deadlock to happen in the middle of the mediation day, before or after as well. So one would be lack of authority. One of the parties, uh, it turns out, does not have the authority to sign or take a decision. There might be some kind of financial situation or a difficulty that does not enable the party to move forward. Uh, it might be that they had a history, that the parties had a history of negotiation and that this went very, very wrong and that they now don't want to see each other. They don't really want to talk that way. They were forced into mediation in order to avoid litigation, but that in reality, 
the history of their negotiation has a huge impact. This leads me to another reason for deadlock that might be ego and saving face. You know, you can't show that uh, that you, you're going to lose. It, it's you can't. Uh, the, the company would never want to lose or uh, in front of maybe uh, competitors. It might also be that uh, parties refuse to continue negotiating because of a tactical move. They think that it's wise in the negotiation not to move forward so that the other party makes the first step. Um, there might be a fear of setting a precedent and internal policies may limit some of the negotiation aspects or they may indeed be lack of trust in the mediator. Many reasons can lead to deadlock. So what are possible solutions? I've just jotted down some of them, but they might not always work. Uh, they're just suggestions and things that I have been reading as well that might help to solve a deadlock in uh, mediation. For instance, anticipate the authority issues mentioned before. Clarify these with the parties beforehand and take steps for expanding this authority, possibly inviting other people, important people in the, in the company to attend. The mediator should ask about the rationale behind certain positions and demands of the parties. Why are you saying this? Open questions. Mediators should be creative in finding options of what we call expanding the pie, namely finding solutions which are not necessary. Monetary, you know, thinking outside the box that can confirm, and this confirms the flexibility of the process. It is very important that reality testing is carried out. For instance, in the evaluation of risks and chances of success and the anticipation of the costs of the litigation. Mediators shall reframe the situation to place the parties in the future. It is also good at a certain point when the parties are tired to refer to the progress that has already been done during the mediation. And mediators shall invite the parties to consider alternatives to settling the mediation. So the best alternative, BATNA, and the worst alternative. Further, it may also be useful to shift one party's perspectives by considering the other party's position. So what do you think the other party's thinking of this conflict? Or if a monetary offer is made and you want to challenge the party, you say, so how do you think that the other party will take this offer? Mm, you know, maybe it's an insulting offer. Um, mediators shall emphasize now and then the neutrality and the role of the mediator, just in order to see that, uh, you know, that they have to trust the mediator when the mediators have the feeling that they're losing this very important trust. So finally, again, I mentioned in the slide that, that focus on progress is, is also important in order to motivate the party. It is also important to understand the parties better, to explore the internal policies and concerns of the company. And for this, it might be also necessary to discuss the wording of agreements in detail and also of the confidentiality agreements. So these are only some of the possible ways to tackle deadlock in a mediation. What you're looking at on the screen at the moment, you already know. In a typical mediation, of course, you have a mediator or co-mediators, the parties to the dispute, whether they're representatives of companies or private individuals, and preferably, when possible as well, their legal representatives. So that's what we're going to talk a bit more about, um, about the characteristics of these parties, uh, their roles, and particularly what uh, Alexander was talking about, which is really one of the most important aspects of mediation, is to be prepared, for everyone to be prepared and for everyone to know their role. 
um, not only in relation to the mediation process in general, but also with um, respect to the specific case at hand and the facts and positions. What is a mediator? That is the question. Um, firstly, we talk about what a mediator is. Um, it's a third party that's supposed to be neutral, that is hopefully professional in the sense of having experience in mediation, particularly for the next bit, which is the process manager. They need to know how to manage the process. Uh, it's really what a mediation is, as there's no decision being taken by the third party. Uh, the the um, third party really needs to know the process and how to guide the parties uh, voluntarily through it. And of course, uh, as Alexander was talking about with even practical examples, they need to uh, stimulate and facilitate uh, open communication and discussion between the parties because normally that's the only way that their progress can be made toward an agreement. What a mediator cannot do is judge. They have no real authority in the case. They might have some authority to manage the process, uh, which is just on the process side. On the substance, they cannot really take any opinions. They cannot criticize, and they have absolutely um, no right to advise one party, especially if they're doing that in front of the other party. That would be catastrophic uh, for the mediation, and it's something that should be avoided. Uh, what uh, Alexander said, that when there is maybe some potential for opinion could be in cases where you're already asking them about their uh, best and worst alternative, and there could be some space for discussion, but um, no advice. So, what is the mediator supposed to do to guide the process, as mentioned? Um, an important part is to capture the overall picture, and I think that as well was discussed by um, Alexandra. There is the conflict itself, but there's a lot of things behind it. Ego, prior relationships, financial interests, and they're not uh, necessarily stated in the positions of the parties at the beginning. So by guiding them through these discussions, um, some of these um, other elements can be identified and hopefully start paving the way to some common ground that could become a, an agreement. And then as you go further into the mediation day, the, the mediator can assist the parties in preparing their offers to one another. So this is more of a negotiation and bargaining phase. And that would lead, uh, once the parties react to the offers, it would lead to identifying, let's say, space for a possible solution. But with that in mind, of course, uh, as Alexander mentioned, reality checks are important. So um, along the way, um, the mediator is supposed to kind of juggle and manage the expectations of the two sides to make sure that they're staying realistic and reasonable. And one of the good things for the mediator is that although they try to lead the parties to a settlement agreement, they do not actually draft it, um, and they are not responsible to ensuring that the agreement that is concluded between the parties is legal and enforceable. That's something really for the legal representatives of the parties, which we'll get to later. Um, now, there is this, uh, this I'm going to go very briefly on this, there are different styles of mediation that you see up on the screen. Um, basically, the idea here is, um, are you just going, as a mediator, do you just go through the process and hope that somehow the solution or the parties will swim to the surface with the solution? Or do you start to become somewhat more guiding with respect to the substance and subject matter of the mediation? Here you already start to tread on a slightly thin line of making sure that you don't cross a boundary into uh, being more than just a mediator and basically to try and um, see if that can help um, change their expectations and perspectives.
So when we talked about co-mediators, I believe we've already discussed why this could be of interest in certain cases and why sometimes the parties to a dispute may indeed request it. Um, it's complexity, uh, different, um, also different skills might be required. Maybe one mediator has more of a technical background, another one more of a legal one. And of course, when the parties are um, uh, come from different linguistic backgrounds, so would perhaps prefer to have one mediator uh, for each language. Now, um, there are certain things that need to be cl made clear by the co-mediators between the two of them in a co-mediatorship is how they're going to divide their roles, tasks, and manage the communication uh, and the process during the mediation. It, it does require coordination because um, what cannot happen there is that one mediator is more with one side and the other is more with the other side because we're like a representative and we're, we lose the point um, of the mediation at that stage. So really they have to both be equally accessible and open uh, to both parties. It's important for the co-mediators to, to have a good strategy on this before starting. Now, the parties um, do play, obviously, a very important role if we're talking about whether we're going to reach an agreement or not. And uh, Alexander's talked about this quite a bit. It's really helpful if those that show up to the mediation have the full authority to settle, because otherwise there's a number of problems that could arise. Um, now, they also need to be prepared to and provide in advance um, before the mediation day, the summary of their summary of their perspectives on the dispute and their positions. Um, now, they also need to be prepared to explain that um, clearly at the onset of the mediation day during the openings. Um, and then basically, it's good that if they can come with a mindset to be prepared to make offers or consider offers. Again, we go back to this BATNA and WATNA. Uh, if, if a party to a dispute can enter a mediation already within this psychological frame, uh, the, the whole mediation will go a lot smoother and especially for the, for the mediator. So it's, again, uh, preparation, very, very important. Uh, on that topic, the parties, is helpful if they understand the mediation process. If they feel lost at any point, they can ask the mediator to explain. It's really as process manager, the mediator's a job. Um, and uh, as mentioned, they have to be able to express their issues and positions and hopefully have have gone some sort of undergone some sort of reality check to understand hopefully with their lawyer the strengths and weaknesses of their case uh, important to <laughs> during the actual meetings important for the parties to listen without interrupting that's always helpful to the the meeting dynamic because uh, they'll both get a chance to speak and it's great when they um become more open and start to share their thoughts and positions um, with the mediator and the other party as well. And even better still, when they're ready to start with an offer, provided that it's a, a reasonable offer, because um, uh, the mediator also needs to work with the parties to, let's say, prevent insult offers from happening, which would really just um, kind of throw the whole process off course if one party feels insulted. Lawyers, of course, we've talked about already, they're very important. They, they should be helping their client throughout, um, throughout the process as they have been in the uh, formal proceedings as well. They, as always, they need to prepare documents, particularly when there's uh, legal aspects to the documents. Um, and have coached, hopefully, the, the client on the realistic strengths and weaknesses of the case. Um, we consider those good lawyers. And then their, really their big uh, responsibility comes at the end, if it's successful, that they, they are really 
at the front of the drafting of the settlement agreement because of the legal nature of these types of contracts. Um, so the lawyer within the preparation, we've basically gone through most of it, um, preparing the client, understanding what the mediation is, both the lawyer and the client should understand that it's helpful if not obtain information from the mediator. Uh, at, at the stage that they're going in, I think they've already realized that uh, mediation has um, certain advantages. So um, that's probably why they're there to begin with. And um, being realistic is helpful. This will help the um, negotiations uh, go forward. Um, and then all of the different processes that Alexander discussed, such as choice of mediator and uh, preparing the case summary and opening statements, um, even in in the agenda drafting, maybe, but that that really depends. I think, uh, as Alexander mentioned, often she's kind of more proactive in setting the agenda and pretty much expecting the parties to agree, but these are all things that the lawyer should be taking care of with respect to their client in the, in, uh, the preparation phase. And on mediation day, um, I go, again, I, I've referred to the idea of a good lawyer, and I guess there, there's reason for it um, I, that I'm not gonna get into, but you are likely already aware. A good lawyer, I think, can be a mediator's ally because they're being realistic on the points of law being discussed, and um, they're the ones potentially that have even recommended mediation uh, to begin with. So they're the ones that can really move the parties towards an agreement. And now continuously throughout the day, as they have throughout the process, they'll need to give advice to the client, whether legal or if it's a business lawyer or in a particular technical field, also commercial or technical advice as, it, as different issues come uh, up during the day. And with the legal background, it can be applied to exploring also um, other solutions that maybe weren't thought of at the point that the mediation day started. Um, reality is <laughs> really uh, trying to achieve some sort of reality or reality check for the clients is an ongoing uh, task uh, for a good lawyer, but also for the mediator. And um, often when we talk about reality, we do have to think about the costs. The costs are not only legal costs, the cost could be, um, depending on the type of case, uh, damages that might come up, uh, time spent, or the um, impossibility of rolling out a product line that's already been in the making. There's so many costs that can be calculated. So all that uh, into saying that if the lawyer is successful in, in um, managing uh, the expectations and um, the reality check of the client, there's a better chance in reaching a settlement agreement, which is this concluding phase uh, at the end. And then really um, the lawyer takes over in order to hash out the technical details of the agreement. So with that, I'm finished. I hope, I believe we do still have time for some questions and answers, about 15 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. So do I give it back the floor to Dung and she takes over? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Goran. Uh, and it's true, we, we have a lot of time at least 15 minutes for our Q&A session. Excellent. So uh, thank you very much, Alessandra and Goran, for your uh, presentation. We covered the different phase of the mediation process, the challenges to IB mediations and the different actors in mediations. I think now we open the floor for Q&A session uh, from audience. If you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or you can type your questions in the chat box. And... Uh, we will address uh, your questions to the speakers. I think we have already received uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, I will show this on to our speakers. Um, thank you, speakers. I have two questions regarding the effectiveness of mediations and history. The first question is, um, how can we assess or determine the effectiveness 
of mediation process and what criteria or principles are you to evaluate its uh, efficacy? The second question is uh, among the three style of mediation that you mentioned, which one are the most popular? Or we can use them at the same time on the mediation date. Uh, I think for the first question, I would like to address this question to Alessandra and the second questions I would like to address to Goran. So I would like to invite Alessandra first. Thank you very much. That's a highly interesting question. How do we assess or determine the effectiveness of the mediation process? So I guess um, as to the assessment of whether a mediation is effective, it will be up to the parties to decide if they have considered that uh, this mediation has led to a positive result. It will also depend on the pace of the mediation on how quickly um, negotiations proceed. Uh, obviously, a very ineffective mediation will be if one of the parties blocks uh, the mediation process or you know, continues entering into a deadlock, provoking a deadlock. Um, these would be also the criteria to evaluate its effective efficiency. Um, I would not consider it, to inverse the question, a criteria of efficiency, whether uh, at the end of the day, an amicable solution, whether at the end of the day, a settlement has really been reached. For me, there's no such thing as a successful or unsuccessful uh, mediation, because it is in the hands of the parties. Maybe the two parties have never reached an agreement at the end of the mediation day. However, they have learned, they have got to know, know each other, and they may enter into some kind of commercial agreement afterwards or cooperate and know they, they get to know each other in a better way. This already is very effective and would be a positive outcome. I hope to have replied to the question. Otherwise, we still have time if the person asking would like to have more information. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Alessandra. Yes. Uh, for the second questions, I would like to invite Lauren. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so on the different styles, uh, also a very good question. Well, um, the end of the day, a mediator style can be a kind of personal style. It doesn't have to be defined. It can be that person dealing with two people in conflict. Uh, I don't know. It, I could also ask you a question. How would you do it? How do you handle when your family members are screaming at each other? I don't know if your family members do that. Mine do sometimes and then try to step in. Anyway, to explain the styles that we had up on the slide, uh, facilitative is where really uh, the mediator is focusing more on the process. So instead of going too much into the content, it's just trying to guide the parties through the steps that will have them open up, present different um, viewpoints or different even feelings. Sometimes it's just feelings so that they could be considered by the other party and see, ah, oh, okay, I didn't know you were feeling that way or I didn't know that could be a possible solution. And that would guide them towards uh, some sort of agreement. Evaluative usually is when there's a more... Um, confident or experienced mediator on a specific subject matter that's the heart of the the conflict now i say this because for example i was recently also in um in a seminar with uh, some former u.s judges that uh, have become mediators so they end their terms as judges and open a mediator practice. They're extremely confident. They've ruled on hundreds of cases before. They know, they even know what the detriments to parties are in their own rulings, because they've had to experience. They said, you lose, you win. So I know what the loser is suffering. And with this knowledge and knowing that this can happen to either one of you or both of you, I start to give hints throughout the mediation as to what kind of batna watnas uh, you should be considering and guiding you in the direction of a potential settlement. Um, it's more active than the facilitative, particularly on the substance. The transformative, um, look, I invite anyone 
to Google it and uh, look it up. It's relatively new. Um, it's, how would I say, it's a bit more maybe psychological, if that's the way of um, describing it. You're not folk with transformative, you, you trying to kind of give second position to the conflict and second position to the solution. What you try to do is focus really more on the parties. What is there something in their relationship that has brought up this conflict? What could that be? And how can we address it through dialogue? And that eventually hopefully paving the way again to an agreement. But I mean, these are, these are how would you say, boxes and theories that don't necessarily need to exist. They can be more tools for a mediator to consider in their own style and approach to a particular case. And especially once the, what's important is to know who the parties are, what they're like, and what the conflict is. Then you can even adjust your own personal style going in uh, according to the way you think will work best. And I see uh, a yellow hand being raised by Alexandra. Thank you very much. I would just like to compliment your, your answer with uh, my personal experience here at EUIPO since 2012-2013. Um, what we usually do here at EUIPO is apply the facilitative. Um, we are much more inclined to just be the mere guides. And this is also very important for us as IP experts, because we also um, work in decision taking departments of our office. So usually we're the people taking the, the, the decisions. So what we have to do when we uh, are mediators, we never have anything to do with the case, with the deciding of the case itself. We are neutral, neutral facilitators. Actually, we, this is the way we often call each other as well in, in, the, in the legal, in the regulations and, and the rules we have for us. We're neutral facilitators. So obviously, often we're asked, as I mentioned before, what do you think of the outcome of this appeal? Do you think we will win this appeal? I had many parties ask me and I said, well, this is not for me to decide. This is not the point of the mediation. Obviously, the closer it comes to a settlement after the exploration phase, when we enter the bargaining phase, where it's necessary sometimes to do more reality checking. How do you feel that you will win this case? Have you looked into? And then obviously our own knowledge comes in. This might be a bit more evaluative. So to answer the question, there might be several systems and several styles that we use at the same time on a mediation day. Absolutely. And if I could also add, that's a really excellent point, I think. As a, a public body, a public authority, a really uh, facilitative is the recommendable way to go for the most part, because um, you don't want to raise any doubts at any stage in the process. You really need to be showing it, taking extra effort to show your neutrality. Uh, could be one of, in fact, as a mediator for a public body, that might be one of your primary concerns. So, to the extent that our participants are actually representatives of public bodies that are already offering uh, ADR or considering offering of ADR, uh, a focus on facilitation would be the suggested, uh, facilitative, sorry, would be the, uh, the suggested approach. Thank you. Hope, hope that answered the question, but if not, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to discuss styles. It's, it's a fun discussion. <laughs> Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Warren and Alessandra. Um, we received another question uh, from the audience, uh, from our colleagues from Brunei. I think I would like to address these questions to Alessandra. How many days, hours um, do you usually set aside for mediations? What happens if the matter has not concluded within the set time, but parties still wish to continue to negotiate? Thank you for this question, which is, which is very pertinent, actually, because I was discussing this, discussing this with my boss yesterday. Um, you know when a mediation starts, but you never know when it can end. So 
Um, nowadays, with online mediations, um, we try we try to have the matter settled at most within a couple of months, but it always depends on the parties and how they react. So we don't have a, a fixed time frame for that. Maybe we should think of one. We tried to, to uh, have the parties reply, but then you think we normally contact the representative of the parties. The representative will then firstly address uh, their client who may be in the United States in Asia, somewhere in Europe. And then the lawyer representative waits for a reply. So this is obviously some time that we cannot count in. We don't know, we will ask them, we will set deadlines. So can you please send the summary usually the first summary that we were mentioning before, within 20 days from the appointment of the mediator. And reply to the questions, the preliminary questions I was showing you before. Can you please send us a written reply within two weeks? We have to give a reasonable time frame for the parties to think about it because otherwise we can't rush them too much because then we won't get the replies we want and we can't delay uh, too much in time either because then uh, the parties will get frustrated especially if one is waiting for the outcome in order to commercialize their products or something uh, of the sort. So we try to keep the pace but it is for me impossible to tell you how many hours do I set aside. I just remain at the disposal of the parties and uh, try to set the pace. Um, I can tell you, I must confess, I, uh, that one of the mediations I'm currently dealing with right now started uh, approximately in March 2020, uh, and it's still ongoing. Obviously, the confinement and COVID did not help, but uh, that's the fact. And, and we're still on it because in order to reply to the second question, if the matter has not concluded within the wished time frame or the, what we would have wanted, we will obviously still continue to negotiate if, there, if we can see that there's a real intention to negotiate. Because what we have also seen at EU IPO, since, as I explained before, mediation automatically suspends appeals. So what we have seen in the past, unfortunately, is that there has been a kind of, let's call it, abuse of the mediation system. So a party is actually not interested in settling the matter. He's not interested either in having a decision taken by the Board of Appeal because probably it's a negative. Uh, he, he has evaluated its chances, his chances of succeeding and has seen that he will not succeed. So he prefers to have it suspended and then see what happens. Maybe he continues producing a product which was only uh, intended for the market for a certain amount of time. Uh, think about uh, sports shoes or some, some, some item that has only a, a very limited time frame on the market. Well, the party might attempt to suspend the, the appeal so that his trademark is not rejected and uses mediation with this abusive uh, purpose. In such a case, we would notice it because we would see that we're not receiving any replies from the parties within the deadlines we set. So there we would say, I'm sorry, I'm afraid that we will have to conclude this mediation if we don't receive your reply within a month, put it, and then we will conclude the mediation and we will resume the appeal proceedings. This is, um, I think, covers covers the, re the the question. I hope. And and if I could briefly, that the the timing is hard to quantify unless you've been, um, let's say, following your own experiences over time. Um, and the reason is it well, it's actually built into the definition of the mediation process, which is voluntariness. So you cannot, you don't have a mediation if both parties didn't decide to go ahead. Now, even if they did decide to go ahead, doesn't mean that they've decided to go ahead at any particular speed. And so you can, as Alexander pointed out, you can try to push and motivate them, but inevitably 
it's up to them as to what the next steps are when if they're both in a rush then you'll see them getting to you very quickly and trying to get it settled but um, if one of them isn't the one might stall and if both aren't because they just want the suspension to keep going which is in the case of the eu ipo it can stay for a long time it's it's quite all over the place due to the voluntary aspect of the definition of mediation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Goran and Alessandra. I think maybe we had time for one last question uh, before we go for a break. Um, these questions also relate to the mediation process. So I would like to invite Alessandra um, to address these questions. Um, do you allow lawyers to be present? And how do you deal with the interventions by lawyers during the choice sessions? and individual calculus? We obviously um, encourage lawyers to be present, uh, both lawyers and uh, representative of the companies involved, ideally the CEO, as we were saying before, regarding the authority issues. So, so yes, we do. And the first contact is actually with the lawyers, our primary contact, who we will then ask for permission to contact the parties. Um, lawyers are very useful in a mediation, as uh, Gordon pointed out, because they provide the legal aspects of the case, and they also are in charge of drafting the settlement agreement and of looking into many matters such as enforcement and all the clauses they want to have included. It may happen, however, that uh, lawyers are not as happy with uh, going into mediation because maybe they're not earning uh, the fees they would be earning in a court proceeding. Um, although I, I do believe that lawyers more and more favor mediation and are becoming uh, advocates of, of mediation during the, the last years because it's becoming more and more popular as we were seeing at the beginning of the afternoon. Um, so if a lawyer is difficult, and if we see that a lawyer is being very entrenched in the legal aspect and in their positions of winning the case from just a purely legal point of view, what we would do sometimes is separate the lawyers from the clients. We would say, uh, look, uh, we would like to talk to the clients alone, if it's possible, could you please wait outside? It's not something that they like very much, <laughs> but obviously since the client is there as well, the client is the one who decides, is the one who, who has the whole process in, in their hands, right? So sometimes it's necessary to separate, but what we would do then in order for them not to be offended, which is also very important to take care that no one is offended, is we would give the lawyers a task could you please look up this and this um, in the regulation? Would you, would you mind um, quickly drafting uh, what points, what legal points would you have to, would you like to have included in the settlement agreement in order to discuss with the IRS other parties lawyer? Or we would actually sit the two lawyers together to ideally start drafting the settlement agreement while we continue talking with the parties. So they are indeed very, very useful lawyers in the mediation. 